let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. It doesn't come as a surprise, especially if you know the Corinthian culture, because it was, we talked about that. Corinth was a cosmopolitan city, meaning there were various people from various uh, uh, language groups and various nations who are there. And it's a port city, meaning that everything was permissible, kind of, that kind of a city. And you have no problems with sexual immorality there, right? But here yeah, it, is, it, is, it is very surprising that within the church there is sexual immorality. And he says that even the pagans do not condone. Even the pagans do not accept or tolerate these kinds of things. A person is having an illicit relationship with his own father's, father's wife. Okay, uh, we do not know, maybe a stepmother. But still, it is a relationship that no uh, religion or no culture would even condone. And this is happening right within the church. So what is he saying? He is saying, you still hold him as a person who is belonging to the fellowship. He says, I am with you in the spirit. What is he talking about now? We are going to deal with this because this is something that Paul is writing. And we know that all scripture is God breathed and uh, some things might make us uncomfortable. But still, that still we believe is the scripture. And therefore, we still read it and we still learn from this. Yes? Okay, all right. So here he is saying, as this is all happening, he's saying, I am there with you in the spirit. How is that? What is he actually talking about? I am with you in all that you do, meaning I know everything. And my counsel, even though I'm staying away, my counsel is still with you. So this writing becomes the spirit in which he is staying with them. He is counseling them, saying, if, if I was there, if I were there, this is what I would tell. And what is he saying? He is also including Jesus Christ. He is saying the church is there. Jesus Christ's presence is there. My presence is there, not physically, but I am there with you in my authority as an apostle. And what does he want them to do? To hand this man... Over to Satan. What is this? Handing over to Satan. We don't see any kind of a precedence like this before. We don't find this kind of a word used anywhere in the scripture before. But all of a sudden he says, hand him over to Satan. What does he mean by that? And he says, why do you have to hand him over to Satan? Why? So that his flesh will be destroyed and on the day of the Lord, he will, his spirit will be saved. What is he meaning by that? Just think about that. Have you thought about this? What's this handing over to Satan? According to Paul, this is how it is, that the, that the church belongs to Christ and the world belongs to world meaning everybody who is not walking in the counsel of God or automatically walking in the counsel of the devil. And therefore, you hand him over to Satan, meaning you expel him from the church. That is what he is actually meaning so that, you, you understand this, so there is no mystical handing over to the Satan. You understand that? Just like you, Stephen would say, oh, I commit my spirit to God or, you know, you can't commit people to Satan, but if you put them off away from the church, if you discipline them, you are automatically putting them into the realm of Satan, and why is he doing that? Not because he, is want, he wants, to, uh, wants the other person to be destroyed, but still with concern, so that when he goes there, he will lose this fellowship, and he will understand that this is more important, and maybe there is a chance for him to repent, Maybe his body, or rather, what is the sax? It's not the physical body, okay? Greek word is sax, which means the sinful nature, so that his sinful nature would be destroyed and his soul might be saved. So if there is no discipline, meaning not, uh, if there is no discipline given, if there is something wrong in the church, and if there is no disciplinary action taken, what happens? That person cannot repent at all. But once that is happening, meaning that you expel him, these are strong words again, right? Because we always believe that Jesus is always accommodative, yes? He's always saying, sinner, come to me, it's okay, right? Yes or no? But at the same time, when it comes to the church, 
You know, Paul, or even Jesus, even the last week we looked at that, where God would say, you yourselves are the temple of God, meaning plural, all of you together are the temple of God. If anyone destroys the church, he says, I will destroy them, meaning if anyone destroys the temple, if anybody is bringing, if there anybody is, is disrupting the church, God says it's not from outside, it is from within, okay? And God is very, very, because why, why does he do that? Look at, this, uh, look at the passages like Ananias and Sapphira. They brought deception into the church. They deceived. They sold the land and they did not bring it. And, and, and they came to Peter and they said, this is all that we sold it for. They are bringing deception into the church. Still now, till now, at that point of time, you would find that the church was kind of pure and they are all very, almost, almost innocent. There is, no, uh, uh, there is no guile there. There is no cheating. You know, everybody is transparent. Everybody is frank. Everybody is honest. But now they are bringing deception into the church. And that is when Peter had to say, or Peter almost pronounced a curse on them. And you know, both of them fell dead. And you would know that it is something that when you read it, you don't even understand. Why is God doing that? Isn't he a loving God? Isn't he someone who accepts people? Yes, he accepts everyone who comes to him. But when it comes to the church or the body of Christ and someone who claims himself to be a part of the body of Christ, they are spreading something that is destroying the church. Paul would say, we still have concern for the person. We still love the person. We still want that person to be saved, but for that person to be saved, what do we do? We discipline them. We give them a way by which they are away from the church, and maybe they'll come to a realization. But if, some, if today I say, don't come to the church anymore, you'll be the most happiest person ever, right? Hey, freedom, <laughs> right? There is no way of disciplining today, yeah? If you, discipl if you get, get disciplined today from here, you would say... There is another pastor who is welcoming you, welcoming you with open arms. Please come. Yes? No? Can we discipline today? Saying, hey, you are disrupting the church. We will expel you for two weeks. That's the punishment. That's not a punishment. That's enjoyment. That is vacation. That's basically, you know, almost, almost approved by the pastor. Okay? So you can very well say, he told me not to come. We cannot do that today, but at that point of time, you need to know the apostles had, not because they were, you know, lording it over, saying you can't do anything against us, but there was uni unity within the church. If the apostles said so, meaning that it has to be done. And it's not just the local church, it's the universal church. You will not be accepted by, if you are not a part of the Corinthian church, if you are uh, not accepted by the Corinthian church, you might go to Colossae and still they will not let you win. Meaning you have no access into the church at all. And why are they doing it? So that, you know, people will be able to change. So this is something that we find it very bitter, actually. It's something we find it very difficult to wrap our minds around. But this, this is a reality. And sometimes we need to understand. Oh, we might not expel you from church, but are you a person who's disrupting? Why is he talking about all of these things? See, he's saying, because we love him. And he also goes on, your posting is not good. Even in verse one or two, he mentioned the same thing. It is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you and a kind that even pagans do not have. And verse 2, and you are proud. How could they be proud? And verse 6 also, your boasting is no good. It's not good. They are boasting about what? We have a problem that no one else has. Yeah. <laughs> In our church, we have a problem no one else has. What's this boasting all about? Paul is saying he is, he is really angry with the church, not, not just because, every, see, the church, is, church, church means that we all make the church. And as human beings, no one, is, no one is perfect, yes? No one is perfect. Can anyone say I'm perfect? No, we're all imperfect. And imperfect people coming together, and therefore the church in itself, we can never say, hey, everything is good here, because we are all Imperfect people. But can we boast? Can we justify being that, um, uh, having that uh, 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 imperfectness in us, imperfection in us? Can we justify? But it looks like they are proud about that. They are boasting about that. And Paul says, how can you boast about that? And we are not even, we are not really able to understand why are these people boasting about him? Why are they even doing this? We have no idea at all because Paul is not giving us the data. But for them, they really understood because... He's writing to people who already know 
what was happening. Yeah? You get it? For, but for us, for, the, for us, we are I mean, not a part of the Corinthian church. We really do not know what is happening. Why are they boasting? But we are able to really at least assume what is happening. Because look at that. Later on, he goes on to say, verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Meaning, he had already written to them. We, we think this is First Corinthians. This is the first letter to the Corinthian church. But in fact, it looks like he had already written to them. I wrote not I'm writing here, I wrote already, he's already written to them, and he's already cautioned them not to associate themselves with these kinds of people, and he is, uh, he is writing a second letter, and when the second letter is reaching them, they have still not taken action, meaning, it looks like, when you look at the whole passage, it looks like this person is very influential, it's, it's like, you know, he's, he's powerful, maybe wealthy, and therefore, sometimes it becomes very difficult to discipline, right? Discipline always happens for People who are normal people, no wealth, then you will be disciplined, right? <laughs> if you have wealth, yeah, that's a totally different law altogether for you, right? Even Christians will, see, there is nothing wrong, we are all sinners, right? But by Christ, because of Christ, we are sanctified, not because of our works. And that means that we are all sinners. But at the same time, can we support a sin? We definitely love the person, but can we support the sin? And especially as it is becoming a problem. Look at why he is talking about all of these things, because in verse 6 again, don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Why do I want this man out of the church? Because you know about yeast, right? Little yeast is leavening the whole batch of dough. Meaning you add a little yeast, it's not going to stay there. It is going to spread. And therefore, Paul is concerned about the church. This is very important. God is always concerned about the universal picture. Yes, he, each one of us are important as long as we don't create a problem for his universal plan. You get it? As long as... We don't create a problem for the universal plan, meaning the church, if we are disruptive, it's not that everybody is perfect, but if our sin is creating a problem, we are influencing other people, and he is very cautious to say, I want him out of the church because he is creating problems. Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. What is he talking about this leavened and unleavened bread? You all know the reference. He is actually comparing uh, the Passover and that is why he would say Jesus became the Passover lamb and was sacrificed. So he is saying, the, you, you all know about the leavened bread. You all know about the unleavened bread. You know about how Jesus saved you, the Passover. Passover lamb, the Passover is basically the salvation, where you find unleavened bread was used, there was no yeast, now you have yeast. So he's kind of making a comparison between the Passover event and what is happening here, and that is why he is using this, and he says, you are being corrupted by malice and wickedness. That is what he is saying. Get rid of the old yeast, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness. So he is saying, East is like this. Or rather, I'm comparing your malice and wickedness. What is malice? This is something that you do against people. And he is saying, this immorality, you know, you need to understand, what is this immorality? What, what, what was, you know, why is this kind of an incest wrong? Or even if we talk about sexual immorality, what are we talking about? Is it sexual enjoyment that we are talking about? No, enjoyment is right. It's no problem at all. Immorality would be that for my enjoyment, I use somebody. You understand that? Using meaning exploiting somebody. That becomes immorality. You get it? And that is why adultery would be considered something of an immorality because for yourself to be benefited, what do you do? You hurt somebody. It doesn't matter. Right? That is why rape is wrong. Why? Because it, it, it kind of satisfies the rapist. Right? But we don't condone it. Why? We need to condemn it. Why? It's sexual immorality. Meaning you are using Another person for your benefit. And sexual immorality all through the scripture has been defined this way. That it is not about the enjoyment about it. It is basically, are you using another person for your advantage? You don't care about the hurt or harm or anything that you are inflicting upon them. But all that you want is pleasure. And that is what here it is all about. At this point of time, we need to understand that women were not given importance at all. A man could do anything and get away with it. You understand that? And who are the ones who are exploited? Who are the ones who are exploited? The women. 
And therefore, so in this relationship, do you think it's basically the father's wife coming and saying, oh, I want to live with you? No, it's this man because he has got some clout and he's got influence. He says, this is something unattainable, but I'm still going to do it because it is something of important to me. It is satisfying me. Maybe, you know, some kind of a kick he gets out of this, but this is using another person for his benefit. And God is saying, if you have people like that within the church, exploitative people, be very careful that they do not destroy the church. Because the church is not about exploitation. The church is definitely standing against exploitation. So this is what Paul is trying to bring it out here as he's talking about, take this malice out of you. Take this wickedness out of you. Instead of that, there needs to be sincerity. There needs to be truth. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, meaning that your love is not exploitative. It's sincere. You are true in what you are doing. I wrote to you in my letter earlier also, which we do not have here, not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. So what is he saying? When I'm talking about stay away from these people, I'm not talking about people outside the church because if you have to, if I'm giving you a command like that, that means... You cannot even live in this world, but for us who are the sinners always, don't mingle with the sinner. If someone says to you, who's that sinner? Yeah, you go out with your friends, that's basically the sinner, okay? Because that's the world, right? You understand that? But for Paul, who, are you, who, you, who do you need to be careful with? Who you associate yourself with? Outside or inside? Okay. What is he talking about? Because he is talking about how it could affect the whole fabric of the church itself. So he is saying, I'm not talking about the people out there. And he is comparing these immoral people with whom? With the greedy, the swindlers, the idolaters. What do everything have in common? Greedy, idolatry, swindling. And then he will also go on talking about in verse 11, the second part of it. He will also talk about uh, a slandering drunkenness, what do all these have in common? Yeah, they are all selfish, and they are all self-centered, they are all good for the people who are using this, but it's for bad for the people around them. You get it? Slandering, what's that? You go and talk about a person, yeah, bad things about a person, and you like it, because it's time passed for you, it's time passed for the other person, but it is hurting and harming the person that you are talking about greedy, yeah, I take your money because I'm greedy, I like it, and therefore I'm having a good life, but you have become the victim. What is idolatry? Why is idolatry wrong? Who gains out of idolatry? The idolatry is this, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically, you know, making an idol and all of those things. We always believe that there is, how many gods? How many gods? One God, right? That is the biblical teaching. We are a monotheistic religion. We believe that there is one God. And therefore, we do not say other gods, right? Because that would mean that we are also accepting that there are other gods. Though there are no God, other gods, there is only one God. And if someone is saying this is God, that, is, that means that they have formed something false, right? There is only one God. They have created something false and they are calling it God. Why are they doing it? Because they don't like the God, and they want to create something that would please them. Every idolatry, you know, any idolatrous practice, you look at that, there will be exploitation, there will be victimization. In an idolatrous practice, you know, hurting somebody is not a problem at all, because the God that they had created, himself or herself will, no ha will ha have no problem exploiting. You get it? And therefore, for any kind of uh, exploitation, for any kind of uh, prejudice, you have a God who will accept that. You are a sexually immoral person and your God that you created is no dissimilar to you. It's not dissimilar to you. He or she is going to condone it. They are going to be okay with it. You understand that? You get it? We have caste system and we say, hey, this caste is low, that caste is high. You know, I don't mingle with you. Then I create a God who would say, yeah, that is true. Because I created some people from my head, some people from my feet. So you create a God who is going to, who is actually a reflection of what you want to do in life and you create a God. That is idolatry. You get it? So idolatry in itself is exploitation. There is someone who is using idolatry for their own benefit. You want to put down women, you create a God for whom a man is much more superior than a woman. 
And therefore, when you follow that God, what happens? You can justify having a prejudice against gender or, or social status or anything like that. You get it? So idolatry becomes exploited. So what we are trying to say is he is clubbing everything together. Greedy, idolatry, swindlers. You know, I care not about you, but only about my, uh, my coffers. I will take everything from you. Any exploitation, Paul says, which he obviously includes the sexual exploitation, cannot be a part of the church. And a person who does that, and he is trying to make the church take that also, or be influenced by that, put him away, he says. Verse 12, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Now he is very clear. So it is not ambiguous at all anymore. Earlier he said, hand him over to Satan. And we were a little bit confused. But we looked at the whole context and we were able to understand. Now he is making it very clear. He is actually stating it out. What I want you to do with that man is, what do you do? Expel him. And why? Because we have a right to judge the church. We have no right to judge people outside. Let God judge the people outside. We will judge the people inside based on the teachings that we have received. So this is important. Being, having discipline, having the, the understanding that I, yeah, all of us are sinners and we need to ask forgiveness from God and we need to move away from that. We have to repent. We have to change. But if we become an influence on other people, that our sins that we influence others to become like us, not in good things, but in bad things, then the Bible clearly says that you are supposed to be out of the kingdom. And Paul is so vehement to do that. I am a sinner. I need to grow away from my sin. I need to walk away from that. I need to change, make a change in myself. But if I'm becoming a bad influence, that is when I check myself and I know that I'm definitely against God, I'm definitely against the church, and God himself is not very happy, he's really upset with me, and I need to change. Because destroying the church of God is something that needs to be dealt with very severely. You get it? If any of you have disputes, has a dispute with another, chapter 6, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people. So the second problem here, one is that the sexual immorality of incest that is there, and they are not even considering that to be a problem. They are even proud of the problem that is there. And now Paul says, no, it has to be dealt with because it is affecting the church. Now there is another problem that they have, the, the, the Corinthians have. What are they doing? They have disputes among themselves. And they, instead of taking it to the Lord's people, what is this, Lord's people, and he's calling ungodly uh, judges. What is he talking about? It looks like they have problems. Why, why would there be lawsuits? Why would there be problems within the church? What's a lawsuit? Someone files a lawsuit against you, meaning that, why, why, why do they do that? Why would they do that? Uh, so, something you have done that has hurt them, harmed them, you have cheated them, right? Why can that be? A part of the church, meaning some people within the church are filing lawsuits against another person within the church because within the church there is exploitation and victimization and the victim is going to the court and it looks like you know, the exploiter is going to court as we read the whole passage you would understand. They are taking it to, uh, to somebody else outside the church and Paul is very angry. How can you even have lawsuits within you? Meaning that would mean that someone is cheating you from within the church. How can you allow that is Paul's uh, query. And he's very, very angry. As you look at the tone, you would find that he is not uh, you know, very loving in all of these passages. Yes? Are you able to see the tone? Yeah, he's, he's upset. He's angry. And, or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? So he is saying, you, uh, the church people, need to know what is right, what is wrong, and to take care of judgment within because he also goes on saying this is something that comes out of the blue because he doesn't back the statement with the, any textual proof where he says we will be judging whom? The world and the angels? You have any proof uh, anywhere else in the Bible where God says, you know what, you'll judge angels? He does not give any textual proof. Okay, but, but he is saying this. Maybe he is meaning that because we are supposed to reign with God and therefore when God judges people, we are also along with him, and in that way, maybe, okay? But he doesn't give any textual proof, and this is the only part in the Bible which would talk about that, where he would say that we would judge even the 
angels. Okay. So all that he is saying is, you should be competent enough to judge. And what, what, is, the, what is the essential quality for you to judge? What's the essential quality? What's the quality of a judge? Any judge for that matter, what, what does the judge have to know? The law, okay, and they have to know what is right, what is wrong, so that they can tell the person who's doing wrong, hey, you are wrong. They can tell the person who's right, okay, you, you are on the right, okay? So there is some kind of a discernment which is completely lost in this church. This is very, very sad. He talked about discipline, now he's talking about the discernment. You are not even able to understand that there is something wrong. If you are not able to take care of these problems here, then how can you take care of bigger things? You are supposed to judge the world. You're not supposed to, you are not able to judge yourself. There is no discernment. You do not know what is right. You do not know what is wrong. And in all probability, you, you, you're not able to settle it among yourself. You're taking it out there to other people who are already ungodly because he's already said that people outside are already exploitative. Church is where exploitation is not supposed to be. And if there is exploitation here and you take that case, to an exploitative judge, how humiliating is it for the body of Christ? That is his argument. Can we have exploitation here? We cannot. If there is, who's the one who needs to st step in and mend all of those things? Who? The church. And that is the power of the church. That is the power, you know, the authority that God has given to the church. And this is very important. Sometimes we think that personal life church should not get involved in. We give all the freedom. And that is how we are, right? So when it comes to personal life, you know, we don't allow the church to counsel us. We don't allow the church to help us. We don't allow the church to tell us what is right, what is wrong. Because we live in an independent society where we think that no one has the right to. But next to God, who is supposed to do that, the church. That is what he is saying. When you are not doing that, Paul is saying, I'm very angry. How can you take it to another judge? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters... Do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is conned in the church, meaning those people's lives, those exploitative judges outside, we already scorned them because they are not good judges. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? He is saying, you lack wisdom, you lack discernment, you need to know what is right, you need to know what is wrong, you need to take that authority and say, this needs to be changed. If you do not, he is saying, I'm angry. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Look at that. He says the church is already defeated if you have. Is it about a lawsuit between you and somebody else outside? No. You get it? If somebody outside... They come and grab your property, and uh, can you file a police report? Can you go to the police station and say, they stole my mobile? Can you? Can you not? Yeah. Okay, that'll be okay. But if somebody does that in the church, the church should supposed to step in and get that and give it back and say, we don't allow exploitation. You get it? We don't take it outside because that is very humiliating. Where a church, the community where there is not supposed to be any exploitation and you have exploitation and you are taking that exploitation out there so that someone else can give you judgment. He says, no, that cannot be. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Is being cheated okay? Is he asking people saying, hey, if someone cheats you, it's fine. Leave it like that. He is saying... The Lord's name is much more important than your laws. And look at that. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong and you just do this to your brothers and sisters. So the person who's taking a lawsuit, making a lawsuit against somebody, who's that person? Not the victim, but the perpetrator. The guy who's cheated, another guy in the church, he takes it outside to the court for the law to work. You get it? You, you get the irony of it, the seriousness of the issue. Paul is saying exploitation is right there within the church. The church has to discern. The church has to tell people no exploitation. If someone is exploited, justice needed to be meted out right from within the church. So he is talking about the church here. All right. Chapter 6 and verse 12, in quotes it says, I have the right to do anything. And Paul answers, but not everything is beneficial. So they are quoting from somewhere. We have no idea where they are quoting from, but it's a quote that they are using. What are they saying? I have a right to do anything. So they are using uh, a logic here yeah, where they are saying, I have the freedom, right? So freedom is basically the church cannot interfere. I have the right to do anything. 
But he says, even freedom, you don't do use it that way. But anything that is not beneficial, just think about that. I have the freedom. We live in a free country. And we all have rights, human rights. Can I go and uh, slap somebody because I have the right? No, you cannot. You can on the freedom is there only to benefit. Freedom is there only for constructive things, never for destructive things. So here he is, they are, they are uh, incestuous people, they are immoral people, they are greedy people, they are exploitative people, and now when Paul is saying all about all of those things, you need to discern, you need to judge, you need to you know, expel people, they are saying, we have a right to do anything. Because who gave the freedom? Not you, Paul, who gave the freedom? God-given freedom. <laughs> Paul says, Freedom is only for something that is beneficial. And again they say, I have the right to do anything. But I will say to you, you cannot be mastered by anything because any misdeed that you do, any exploitation you do, what, what, it, what it becomes is it becomes your master. Right? That's what he is saying. So it's very, it's very, very humorous when you put it rightly. I have a freedom to become a slave. Can you say that? I have the freedom to become a slave. That's basically what it means when I say I have, the re I have the freedom to exploit. Exploitation is going to become your master and you're going to be hooked on to exploitation. You will keep on exploiting not because you think you are the master but there is something that is driving you and you are using your freedom to become a slave to that exploitation and he says that cannot be. Look at that. And now they have another argument. Food for stomach and stomach for food and God will destroy them both. What, is the, what are they talking about? All of a sudden, they are using another quote. One is, we have the God-given right, and they, God, Paul is saying, the right is to do the right thing, not the wrong thing. If you do the wrong thing, you will become slaves to the wrong thing, and therefore, that, that doesn't even make sense. I have the freedom to become a slave. That doesn't work that way. And then they have the other argument. What are they saying? Food for the stomach, stomach for the food, God will destroy them both. <laughs> And then he goes on saying, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. What are they saying? Je the body needs certain things. Okay? And those things exist. It could be food. It could be sex. They are, exist for me to consume. And we know that body doesn't mean anything because it's temporal. God is going to destroy my stomach, my food. Ultimately, my eternal life is not going to be affected by any of those things. That is their argument. You get it? What they are saying is, my physical crave, you don't judge it because it doesn't matter what I do because ultimately I am going to be, this body is going to be destroyed and therefore my eternal life is still safe. My salvation is still safe because this is just the body. This is the problem of bifurcating, of compartmentalization, or compartmentalizing things saying, this is bodily, this is spiritual. This is worldly, this is spiritual. They are using it very craftily to defeat Paul's argument where they are saying, so what if I'm sexually immoral? Because I, I can only be sexually immoral till I have a body. But I know eternal life does not include my body. So what is the problem here? Anyway, I'm going to be destroyed. The body is going to be destroyed. My spirit is yeah, it's saved. I'm holy in my spirit. Okay? You understand that? Yeah, these are nobody other than, you know, these are Christians. These are the church people. And Paul is really angry. And he says, look at this. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Never say stomach for food and food for stomach. Say the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. You understand that? The body belongs to God. And therefore... You have no right to say that. And then he goes on by his power. The Lord was raised from the dead and he will raise us also. Meaning, you think that, that, that eternal life is only about the spirit. No, no, no. You and your spirit, you and your body, you cannot separate it. That is what he is actually saying. And what kind of immorality is he talking about? He is slowly explaining that. Your bodies are members of Christ himself. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. So, what are they condoning now? What are they justifying? The Corinthian church people, not the outside people, the Corinthian church people, what are they justifying? Being with a prostitute, they are justifying saying, that's just my crave. If I'm hungry, I eat. If I'm sexually longing, then I will use the services of a prostitute it is no different from how I am eating my food and ultimately both of them are going to be destroyed. My soul is going to be saved. 
you see that what is he talking about and he's not putting you know these people down basically the other people you know when he is saying you know how can you unite christ with the prostitute never because uh, the, these women as, especially in the corinthian culture you know i mean no no woman uh, you know comes into this profession basically uh, out of their own uh, will or wish okay they are forced into it it's basically male exploitation and especially in the corinthian culture you need to know there were even temple prostitutes where people would use them as uh, you know they are the priestess there in the in the temple of aphrodite if you know about the corinthian culture it is very very sad you know in, 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 in i think in, in tamil nadu maybe there was a system called devadasis okay you might have heard about that the idea of certain women being there in the temple they are supposed to be serving god but they are supposed to be satisfying every need of any man that comes that way so that and that in the guise of the woman is told this is how you serve god this is exploitation and this was prevalent in corinthians in the corinthian city and these people within the church are exploiting women and they still have the audacity to say what the food is for the body body is for the food both are going to be destroyed but i am saved saved and safe because my spirit is holy you cannot distinguish you cannot separate your soul from your body you cannot say this is spiritual this is physical you understand that everything is physical because we are living in the physical body as we live in the physical body we need to always be spiritual minded you get it there is no differentiation because this is the this is a kind of a terminology we keep on using oh this is worldly this is this is spiritual there is no worldly there is no spiritual you are a worldly person because you are in the world you are a physical person you have a physical body but how you use that are you spiritual minded or do you as he says do you belong to the realm of satan where your mindset is not about is is always exploitative he gives arguments where he says do you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body for it is said the two will become one flesh but whoever is united with the lord is one with him in spirit flee from sexual immorality all of the sins a person commits are outside the body but who were sins sexually sins against their own body so he is using the word body actually three times in different senses i'm just going to just just point them out and conclude he's talking about one the physical body of every other act is is yes there is a you use your physical body but this is basically the intimate relationship and therefore your body is united with somebody in that exploitation and then he is also talking about the body of christ you are a part of the body of christ how can you unite the body of christ with an with an exploitation and then he also talks about the the a concept of oneness that was there in adam and eve where they were one as a family so you are destroying this body as well in your sexual uh, immorality you are hurting christ you are hurting this oneness body which is the family you are destroying this body the personal body the individual body he's talking about body thrice and he says because of all of these things stay away don't exploit sexually do you not know that your bodies are temples of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have received from god you are not your own you were bought at a price therefore honor god with your bodies so he is saying these are things that you use as arguments but i'm going to refute them i'm going to discredit them so there might be people who who are exploited but they will have kind of arguments to justify their exploitation paul is saying no 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 you can never accept exploitation as something that we should so i know this is a long passage but paul is writing so much and therefore we need to discuss at length about all of these things right so as we know this this is what the scripture is saying and i'm trying to expound what is there so the corinthian church had this problem of exploitation in terms of material things that is why lawsuits exploitation in terms of relationship with women especially the first part of it where incest another woman who is not able to she has to give in to the man's uh, uh, whims and uh, fancies because that is the situation that is there and even though this woman is still the father's um, uh, uh, wife this man somehow you, you know is having a relationship and that he is paul is saying people how can you accept that how can you uh, accept any kind of an exploitation even material phys- exploitation how can you have you know and then they are saying hey we are we are not doing this we are not even we are not using even people who who don't want to we are only using people who want to be used 
That's what they are actually saying. Prostitutes, they want to be used. He is, according to them, they, they are just there so that we can fulfill our pleasures. And he says, you cannot do that. You cannot separate your body and your spiritual life separately because the body still belongs to God and honor God with your bodies. And therefore, this is something that we need to understand. No exploitation within the church. If there is exploitation, make a change because God is really, really angry because it doesn't stop with you. It, it, it flows over into the congregation. God doesn't want to do that. God what doesn't want you to do that. And if there is any kind of a, you know, a, a, a monetary exploitation, material exploitation, you know, let's, we need to settle it among ourselves. We cannot have it. And if you ever say, hey, that doesn't even matter, that is a, that, that's not even a person that I'm exploiting, exploiting almost because the society does not even consider them as people. I'm just, that's, that's just the way of the world. God says, honor God with your bodies. So let's bow down our heads and look to the Lord in prayer.